may or may not have been a fan of the Simpsons TV show uh, when you were a kid, but they did have a unique way of holding up a mirror to the idiosyncrasies of Western culture and saying, this is who you are, this is who uh, we are. And there was this one clever episode where there was a new supermarket in Springfield that the Simpsons visit. The supermarket was called the Monstra Mart and a great little tagline for this supermarket where shopping is a baffling ordeal. In this supermarket, product choice was almost unlimited. Shelving reached the ceiling. You could buy nutmeg in 12-pound boxes and the express checkout said a 1,000 items or less. It really is a mirror, not just to American kind of consumer culture, but to our culture, I think, uh, as well. I am still baffled when I go into the supermarket and I see 10 different varieties of tinned crushed tomatoes. It's just tinned crushed tomatoes. Why do we need so many varieties, so many different brands of tomatoes in a can? We live in a world full of options full of choice, and not just with food. We also have it with cars, with phones, with toothpaste, and I also want to suggest this morning with religion. We live in not just a multicultural world, but a multi-religious, a multi-spiritual, a multi-faith world. Which one is right? Which spirituality is for me? Can we even talk like that? Does it really matter in the end? Uh, Many will say that it doesn't matter what you believe about God, one God or more than one God or whatever it might be. They're all basically the same. Each religion just has a different name for, for God, but it's all the same. Well, the Bible passage that we just had read from 1 Kings 18 challenges that view. And it might challenge you this morning. And that's okay. The story takes us back into a time in ancient Israel, after King David, after King Solomon, after the kingdom of Israel has been split into two, ten tribes in the north, two in the south, and we're now in the northern part of Israel, and evil King Ahab is king. And this is how Ahab is described by the narrator of 1 Kings, and it is not a good summary of King Ahab. Listen again. Ahab, son of Omri, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Judah's king Asa. Ahab, son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. But Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight more than all who were before him. Then As if following the sin of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, were a trivial matter, he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and then proceeded to serve Baal and worship him. Now, when you hear Jezebel in the Bible, a shiver is meant to go up your spine. This is an evil match, King Ahab and Jezebel, and Ahab is worse than all who came before him. It is a stinging indictment. Who was Baal that he and Jezebel worshipped? Baal was a, a pagan god of the Middle East and he was thought to be the god of the rains, of the thunder. He was the god of fertility. So when Baal would bring the rain, the land would be richly blessed and people would be healthy and wealthy and prosperous. Worship of Baal became the most prominent of the religions in northern Israel at the time of King Ahab. But the Bible says, and you heard it just a moment ago, that this was no trivial matter in the life of God's people. This was not like just another brand of crushed tomatoes at the supermarket. This was serious. And so in 1 Kings 17, God does something. God raises up a new prophet in the land, and his name is Elijah. And you may have heard of Elijah. He is very famous. He's almost a celebrity, not just of the Old Testament, but also uh, of the New. And Elijah, his initial prophecy was to announce judgment on the land of Israel for their worship of Baal. 
And so a drought came upon the land. And this ought not to have been a surprise to the people of God because Moses had warned them back in Deuteronomy that if they turned away from the one true living God and they started to worship other gods, one of the consequences of that would be drought. And so Elijah prophesies a drought and a drought does happen. And there is a delicious irony in that because who is Baal? the supposed God of the land. He's the God of the rains. And what's the land now facing? Drought. Where is Baal? Can he do anything? The land is in drought. He must bring the rain and nothing is happening. And then in 1 Kings chapter 18, after three years of drought, you know, we had drought a number of years ago and it was a struggle Many farmers and those in rural areas struggled under the drought. You might remember it, water supplies going, water restrictions. You remember water restrictions? Imagine three years of that. And after that time, Elijah confronts King Ahab and he issues a challenge to him. He says to Ahab, Ahab, I want you to gather all of Israel together with the 450 prophets, so-called prophets of Baal. And I want you to meet me on Mount Carmel. Now, we know that name if you've read the Bible before, but Mount Carmel was on the border of Israel and the Sidonians. Sidonians was Baal land. Israel was meant to be Yahweh land. And so we're now meeting on the border on the mountain for a duel to see who the true and living God is. This is not the ancient equivalent of state of origin or Parramatta versus Penrith. This is not that at all. This was a much bigger competition to answer a much bigger question. Who is God? Who really is God? And Ahab agrees. So Ahab summoned all the Israelites and gathered the prophets at Mount Carmel. Then Elijah approached all the people and said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If Yahweh is God follow him. If Baal, follow him. But the people didn't answer him a word. It's fascinating that the people's initial response to Elijah's call is nothing, complete silence. Maybe they were stunned at Elijah's word. Maybe this whole time they thought that they could have some belief in God and some belief in Baal and and whoever else came along, they could have some belief in them too. Maybe they weren't prepared yet just to put their faith cards on the table and say what they truly believed. But anyway, Elijah sets the rules for this new competition. The rules to determine the winner who ultimately is God. Uh, Two altars would be set up with wood, firewood on it. Uh, Two sacrifices were to be made on these two altars and each team was to call upon their God to light the fire, to send fire on the altar and on the wood. And the one who answers, that one is God. And at that announcement, the people finally get their voice and they say, yeah, that sounds like a good deal. Whichever one catches on fire, that's the God that we will believe in. And so you heard the story The prophets of Baal go first, they built their altar, they put their wood on it, they put their bull on it, and then they started to call upon Baal. They started to pray to God, oh Baal, why don't you come and set fire to this this altar? And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, and nothing happened. 1 Kings 18 says they prayed all morning. You know, church is not going to go all morning today, but imagine praying all morning and nothing happened happening. And so at midday, Elijah starts to to mock the prophets of Baal. Uh, Maybe you aren't praying loudly enough, he says. Uh, Maybe Baal is on the toilet. That could be a translation of he has wandered away. Uh, Maybe he's asleep and you need to wake him up. You need to pray and sing louder. And so they did. They danced, they shouted. The Bible says they even cuffed themselves as if that would somehow appease Baal and get him to answer their cries. And they did this all afternoon. And the church goes all day, well and truly into the afternoon, people singing and dancing and praying and nothing happens. Nothing. I don't know if you could imagine uh, being there, watch this all unfold, so much anticipation. This is Team Baal. 
This is the team with all the cash. This is the team with the best players. They are the favourites. They are the minor premiers. This is the Melbourne Storm or the Penrith Panthers of the day. You're expecting big things from this team and absolutely nothing happens. Not even one try. You see, friends, just because you believe something sincerely doesn't make it right because you can be sincerely wrong. And that is what we're seeing here with the prophets of Baal. And so with all this noise going on in the background, Elijah finally steps forward and he says to the people watching, don't look at them anymore. Eyes to me. Come near to me. And then he takes 12 stones and he methodically places these stones representing the people of God, the 12 tribes of Israel, forms an altar, puts the wood on the altar, one stick after another stick after another stick. And whether the prophets of Baal are still carrying on like pork chops over there, we don't know, but he's laying the wood on the fire. He puts the bull that's been sacrificed uh, on the wood. And then he does something strange. He calls for some people to pour some water on the altar. Four jugs of water are poured on the altar. Not just once, not just twice, but three times. Now, Matt was pretty good with his maths, but what's four times three? Twelve. We've got 12 stones, and now we have 12 jugs of water being poured on the altar. Is that significant? Possibly. Now, this seems like a strange strategy to do. If you're wanting your God to set fire to the wood, pouring water all over it is, does not make any human sense. You know, soccer finals are coming up. It's like the, the kid at soccer who kicks the ball the wrong way into their own goal. That's not what you're meant to do. You're not meant to pour water on wood if you want to see it be lit. But anyway, this seems to be the plan. And then late into the afternoon, Elijah finally prays. He says this, Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that at your word I have done all these things. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that this people will know that you, Yahweh, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Now, that last phrase, I think, is important that answer me so that two things will happen. Yes, one, people will know that Yahweh alone is God, but also that he is the one that turns his people's hearts back to him. The fireworks that are about to happen on Mount Carmel are not just a demonstration of the power of God, but the heart of God, his willingness to save and to turn his people's hearts back uh, to him. Now, as I said, I don't know whether the prophets of Baal over there are still carrying on with their singing and their dancing and their false worship, but whether they were making a loud noise or not, at this moment after Elijah prays, there is silence because Yahweh answers. Then Yahweh's fire fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench around the altar. When all the people saw it, they fell face down and said, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. And this episode, I think, really does challenge that postmodern view that all religions are basically the same. This episode tells us, no, that is not the case at all. It does matter what you believe. Hear that again. It does matter what you believe. The God of Israel is the one true and living God, and he is the only one that is worthy of our worship. But some might say, well, that happened all those years ago. How do I know today that God really is real? Why doesn't God come and do some fireworks right here in the middle of the room to prove that he really is real today for this world, for me, so that I might uh, believe? And maybe you've heard people saying, I'm not going to believe in God until he does something to show that he is real to me. 
I remember speaking at a year 12 study camp uh, year after year, uh, talking to to 18-year-olds about their future and about life and and where God might fit into their plans for the future. Uh, Talking about the person of Jesus, his, his life, his death, his resurrection. And many of the kids, I could convince intellectually that Jesus was real, that he died on the cross, that even he rose from the dead. But many of them said they still wouldn't believe unless, this one kid said to me, I'm not going to believe, Mike, until God rearranges the stars in the night sky to spell out my name. I thought, wow, that God is going to adjust the entire universe just to show himself uh, to you. And I'm not sure even if God did that, he would still uh, believe. But friends, the reality is God has made himself known to you and to me. In Hebrews chapter 1, the writer says this, Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. By his son. The revelation of God on Mount Carmel was magnified on the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus heard that incredible voice from heaven say to him and to Peter, James and John who were with him and Elijah, no doubt, this is my son, listen to him. And the revelation on on Mount Carmel was also a foreshadow of how God turns all our hearts back to him. On Mount Carmel, God provided the burnt offering and for us, It was through God again in the person of Jesus on the hill outside of Jerusalem where Jesus became the sacrificial offering for you and for me. And all that we contributed to Jesus on that day was the water of our sins, which after Jesus died was completely taken away like the water on Mount Carmel and then was confirmed to be taken away when Jesus rose again from the dead. If you, friend, are looking for a sign that God is real, look no further than Jesus. If you're looking for a sign that God is not just all-powerful, but that he has a heart for you, look no further than Jesus. In Jesus, God shows himself to the world in the most wonderful way. In Jesus, as God lays down his life for you and for me, we see the heart of God, that it's not just about power and wanting people to respect him. It's about love and sacrifice and generosity. If you want a sign that God cares for you, look no further than the person of Jesus. He is our Mount Carmel. God is real. God is real. As you look around our world, religion might look like a monstrum art, but there really is only one God. All others are just human fabrications and cheap imitations. And I know that sounds harsh, but that is what the Bible says. There is only one true and living God. And I know that many of you here know that. The reason that you're here on a Sunday morning when you could be sleeping in is because you want to worship this God, that you want to sing his praise, you want to encourage others who believe to keep going. And that's my prayer for you too, that you keep believing in this God, that you keep trusting him and his word, that you keep living for him, that you live your lives every day in worship uh, to him. But some of you may have some belief in God and some belief in Baal. And you might think, I don't worship Baal. That's what those pagans did all those years ago. I don't do that. Well, let me just suggest to you that Baal was was a made-up construct to give people a sense of security. He was the one they trusted in to give them prosperity, to give them wealth to give them fertility, to make life better for them. Now, we may not have a statue called Baal today, but there are many modern-day equivalents, aren't they? 
other human constructs that we give ourselves to, that we trust to give us security, to give us happiness, to give us wealth and prosperity. Money is a modern day bar. Sex, relationships, sport, these can all be modern day bars. Yes, they are good in and of themselves, but when we make them God things, like the pagans did to Baal, that's when we get into trouble. Because we're asking these things to do for us what they can never do for us. Money, sex, power, sport, relationships are good, but they cannot ultimately give us what we so often want them to do. We want them to give us happiness. We want them to give us success. We want them to give us wealth and prosperity. And we might get a taste of it, but it doesn't last. These things can never give us what we want them to do. And if we give our lives to them, they will often leave us in a worse situation like the bars of old. Broken hearts massive debt, addictions, and worse. Only God, the God of the Bible, has our true interest at heart. He's the only one who's willing to give himself so that we might live. You know, Jesus said you can only serve one master. You'll end up serving one and hating the other. You cannot serve God and you cannot serve the Baals. We like to believe that we can, but we can't, says Jesus. So let me leave you with the question that Elijah initially asked the people of Israel all those years ago. And maybe it's a question that you need to answer today. How long will you hesitate between two opinions? How long will you try and have some belief in God and some belief in other gods, other things, other structures that you hope will give you what you want? How long will you just hop between the two? Now is not the time for the people to be silent like they did on Mount Carmel initially. Now is the time to make a response. How long? One more day? One more week? One more year? I'll wait till I'm on my deathbed and then I might believe. How long? Elijah says, if Baal is God, then follow him. And if you do believe that Baal is God, take off the mask of Christianity, let it go and follow Baal. But if you do, know where that will ultimately end. But if you are convinced that Baal is a false God and that Yahweh and his revelation in Jesus is the true and living God, if you believe that, then give yourself to him. Follow him and live. What do you believe? Who do you believe? Let's pray. Father, for some of us, we have been hopping between different religions. We have been hesitating in giving our life completely to Jesus out of many different reasons, out of fear, out of uncertainty. For some of us today, as we've listened to this message, we realise that we need to heed Elijah's words and stop hesitating, stop hopping between one belief and another. that the more that we have looked at your character and your revelation, particularly in Jesus, yes, we are convinced that he is real. Yes, we are convinced that he is all-powerful and that he loves us. So for some of us now in the quiet of our own hearts, if that's you, if you have realised that Jesus is the Lord and that you want to stop hesitating and stop hopping, just say in the quiet of your own heart, Lord, I turn to you. Lord, I trust you. Lord, thank you for giving me life in your son. Amen.